So in biblical times, right, when a king went to war, if he conquered the nation, right, the a piece of the robe of the defeated king's robe, right, will be cut off and then sewn into the victorious king's robe, right? So the more nations he conquered, the longer the train of his robe was because he was carrying the bodies of all these nations and kings that he had conquered. So when you saw your king out there in the parades and his robe was really long, his train was really long, you knew your king was that guy. You knew your king was just victorious in battle. So why am I saying this? In Isaiah chapter six, verse one, Isaiah writes that he was lifted to the throne and he saw God high and lifted up in the throne. And he says that his train filled the temple. If you don't know the tradition of the Bible, you're like, ah, God's wearing a really long train. You know, he's that guy. But when you know the tradition of the Bible, you find that what this is saying is that you have a God, right? who's never lost a battle, a God whose train literally fills the entire temple. That means he has the bodies of everything he's conquered. And as I, as I read that and as I think about that, I think about the fact that sometimes we pray to God not knowing the type of God that we're praying to. Imagine going before such a king and being like, are you sure you're ready for battle? And his train is just that long? It'd be audacious of you, but we pray to God and we're timid and we're not sure if he can handle our small little problems, yet his train fills the temple. And as I was sitting there uh, reading and listening to this passage, I was reminded that we must, a bold, uh, we must approach the throne of God boldly, knowing that we have a God who is capable, a God who is, has never known um, defeat, a God who wants us to know that same kind of victory in our lives, and a God who loves us and is on our side, and his train literally fills the temple. Um, I thought that was exciting, and I was really glad to hear that in church this morning, that I would share, and be blessed, and pray boldly. I was 16 years old when somebody gave me a Christian hip hop CD. They had a dude on the front cover, he had dreadlocks like mine, he had a red bandana going across his forehead, a red bandana going across his mouth, and the album was called Bloody Streets. And the dude that gave it to me told me it was Christian rap. And I said, listen bro, I have no degree at Lifeway Christian bookstores, but this is not Christian rap, this man's about to rob a bank. He said, no, 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 this is Christian hip hop, you take it home. I was in a dark, dark, Place. I took that album home. I listened to the album front to back and the eighth song was a gospel presentation and I believed on Jesus listening to that album and I've been walking with him ever since. And I vowed to the Lord Jesus that I would spend my life trying to reproduce that moment for people all over the world like it happened to me. And it just dawned on me, the gentleman behind me, Wes, who helped me to create this project, heard my album several years ago, believed on Jesus, and now he's helping me make records. So now, this is your moment, brother. <laughs> praise God, praise God. Yeah, 10 years ago, this brother released his debut album, Wait and Glory, and a friend of mine at work gave it to me, and it changed my life. I believed on Jesus when I heard that album. And I just want to say I'm a living, breathing testimony that God is working through this music. So this award is for all of us, all of the artists out there that continue to refuse to take Jesus out of your music so that you can be more successful. We see you, and God sees you. Hey, God loves Christian rap, and I think y'all should too. Thank you. This is for Christian hip-hop, baby. This is a message of warning that's been placed on my heart. Not everything that you see is what it actually is. I'm gonna read Proverbs 12, nine. Better to be an ordinary person with a servant than to be a self-important but have no food. This makes no sense to me, so I went to my study notes and it says this. Reality is more important than appearance. Playing the part is not being the part. So many people deceive themselves that because they play Christian or they play man or woman of God, that that's who they are. Are you genuinely following the Lord, denying yourself, taking up your cross, and following Jesus? Or are you just preaching on TikTok stuff that you're not even following? Or talking to people about wisdom that you're not even listening to? Because here's the thing, the Lord sees what you do behind closed doors. 
So yeah, you might get the yes and amen from your pastor or your friends or your TikTok comment section. But the Lord sees what you do when you're not in front of people. Spreading the gospel should never be for our glory or hiding our struggles. Instead, it should glorify the Lord and give us the power to be transparent with each other. So are you following the Lord? Or are you following man and acting like you're following the Lord? Because as I said again, reality is more important than appearance. Anybody can look the part. Anybody can. whoop de do you look the part. God's not deceived, only people can be. So ask God to reveal to you the ways that you're deceiving yourself. And for some people, you know the ways you're deceiving yourself. Be honest, acknowledge the problem or it will never get fixed. And ask God to reveal to you who you should let fill your mind. Because there are so many TikTok creators or pastors that do this for the show and the self-glorification and for the little amens in the comments, but they don't mean none of it. And so many people turn preaching God's word into their own glorification and they start leading people astray. And it breaks my heart for those people, but it breaks my heart for the people being deceived even more. It doesn't matter how many followers someone has or how big their church is, if their doctrine's wrong, if their heart is not in the right place, if they are literally speaking out garbage, you do not need to be letting them fill your mind. So ask God for discernment on who's speaking truth with the right intentions and is gonna lead you towards himself and who's simply doing it for the kicks and giggles and is spitting out complete garbage. Because the thing is, a deceiver is very hard to identify, but God can't be deceived. So in all things, go to the Lord and rely on him with your friendships and your pastor and the TikTok creators you listen to, and God will direct you according to his will and timing. To end this message, I wanna pray for you guys. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I just pray protection over every individual that's encountered this video. Lord, that you would just help them have discernment to see what's right and what's wrong, Lord, and help them to not be deceived by themselves or other people. Protect them, Lord. In Jesus Christ's name I pray, amen. Sorry for being so intense, but this was an intense message. Oh my gosh, you guys, I have more Bible tea. So Jacob has 12 sons, okay? And in Genesis 49, he blesses all of them individually. But today we're going to talk about Judah, Zebulun, Naphtali, and Benjamin. So he blesses them, right? He tells Judah, from your lineage will come the Messiah. So Jesus comes from the line of Judah. What does he promise Zebulun? For Zebulun, he says that you and your tribe will live by the seashore, okay? says, Naphtali, you will produce beautiful words. Okay, and then fast forward, the tribe of Zebulun end up settling near the Sea of Galilee. And by the Sea of Galilee is where Jesus did a lot of his teachings. And it says so in Matthew 4, which we will read right now. Leaving Nazareth, he went and lived in Capernaum, which is by the lake in the area of Zebulun and Naphtali. So legit, God is speaking through Jacob. Now, what about Benjamin and his tribe? This right here shook me. Jacob says to Benjamin, Benjamin is a ravenous wolf. In the morning, he devours his prey. In the evening, he divides the plunder. So I guess the blessing slash, I don't even know, maybe curse, is that he is a ravenous wolf, okay? And guess who is in his lineage? King Saul. This is in 1 Samuel 9, okay? It says, there was a Benjamite, da -da -da -da. Kish is a Benjamite, had a son named Saul. Sheesh. Believe it or not, Saul was anointed and chosen by God to be the king of the Israelites. But Saul started getting consumed by pride. You're too prideful. I need a new king. Guess who the new king is? David, under the lineage of Judah. But it does not end there. Down this line is Paul of Tarsus, bro. But... He was first known as Saul. But remember Saul? Saul killed all, like a bunch of Christians or Jesus followers. And I'm going to show y'all in the word where it says that Paul slash Saul is a Benjamite. 
Paul says, I ask then, did God reject his people? By no means. I am an Israelite myself, a descendant of Abraham from the tribe of Benjamin. So Saul, King Saul, ravenous wolf, bro. And by the grace and redemption of Jesus, Saul became Paul writing down more than half of the New Testament. I had somebody that I love and respect say, if Jesus was sitting right here with you and I, and I had a friend who said, I feel like I was born in the wrong body, what would Jesus say to her? I said, Jesus would say, I love you. You are not a mistake. I think you're amazing. You are fearfully and wonderfully made. But he would also say, this place is not your home. So you're never going to feel completely whole or completely comfortable here because you were made for an eternal realm. You and I are daughters of eternity. That is what we are. And we are here passing through. And so we have to be very wise with how we speak things because we don't want to be harsh or judging when people are so broken that they're believing that they have to make this massive change to heal something that is intimately wounded. What is the hardest thing about being a Christian in 2022? I see a lot of people question things we do, but that's sometimes good because then that gives you a chance to yeah, talk about exactly. the gospel. I'd say discipline, like I think keeping your Christian values in a world that doesn't necessarily respect or understand how I'm Christians. I guess just being kind of different is hard, I guess. Our generation does everything that the Bible says not to do. Yeah. Distraction and just like getting so caught up in like all the other stuff of life and you actually miss out on what like praying in your bible actually what god wants to say to you hope you find peace for yourself new boyfriend ain't gonna fill the void I'm out of here.